Chapter thirty three of England, Canada, and the Great War. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. England, Canada, and the Great War by Louis Georges Desjardins. Chapter thirty three A Case for True Statesmanship. Whatever the true and the false friends of peace may hope and say, it is perfectly useless to close our eyes to the glaring fact that its restoration can only be the result of military effort combined with the highest practical statesmanship. After all what has happened, and the oft-repeated declaration of the rulers of the belligerent nations, it would be a complete loss of a very valuable time to indulge any longer in the expression of views all acknowledge in principle, but which no one, however well disposed he may be, is actually able to traduce in practical form. When writing my French book, in the fall of 1916, reviewing the situation as it had so far developed, I said, quote, All are most anxious for peace however it is infinitely better to look at matters such as they are it is evident that the military situation does not offer the least hope that the war can be immediately brought to an end successes have been achieved on both sides but nothing decisive has yet happened the armies are facing one another in defiant attitude the belligerent nations on both sides have yet and for a long time great resources in manpower and money if germany which should first give up the fight in acknowledging her crime is obdurate to final exhaustion, how can it be possibly expected that the Allies who were forced to fight will submit to the humiliation and shame of soliciting from their cruel enemy a peace the conditions of which, they know, would be utterly unacceptable? Consequently, they must with an indomitable courage and an invincible perseverance go on struggling to solve, for a long time, the redoubtable problem to which they are pledged, in honour bound, to give the only settlement which can reassure the world." I am still and absolutely of the same opinion. The present military situation has certainly much improved in favour of the Allies since 1916. However, looking at the question first from the standpoint of the developing military operations, there is no actual, and there will not be any for many months yet, more or less, practical possibility of a satisfactory peace settlement. Secondly, looking at the question from the standpoint of true statesmanship, it is very easy to draw the inexorable conclusion that, again, there is not actually the least chance of an immediate restoration of peace. Statesmen, responsible not only for the future of their respective countries, but actually for that of the whole world, are not to be supposed liable to be carried away by a hasty desire to put an end to the war and to their own arduous task in carrying it to the only possible solution, a just and durable peace. A broad and certain fact, staring every one, is that the Berlin government will not accept the only settlement to which the Allies can possibly agree, as long as her armies occupy French and Belgian territories. If Mr. Bourassa and his pacifist friends, or dupes, have really entertained a faint hope to the contrary, they were utterly mistaken. Present military events, however proportionately enlarged by the increased resources, in manpower and money, of the belligerents, are not without many appropriate precedents. History is always repeating itself great powers having risked their all in a drawn battle do not give in as long as they can stand the strain considering the importance of the interests they have at stake for the same reason above stated but reversed the allies will not negotiate for peace before they have thrown the german armies out of french and belgian soil and repulsed them over teutonic territory i do not mean to say that peace must necessarily be proclaimed either from berlin or from paris but it will only be signed as the inevitable result of a final triumphant march on the way either to Berlin or to Paris. There is no possible escape from the alternative. In such matters there is no halfway station. End of chapter 33《England, Canada, and the Great War》by Louis-Georges Desjardins Chapter 34 After the War Military Problem Two of the most important propositions of His Holiness the Pope more especially deserve earnest consideration. They are indeed supported by the Allies, who are purposely fighting for their adoption. In his note of the 1st of August, 1917, addressed to the rulers of the belligerent nations, the Pope says in part, quote, at first, the fundamental point must be to substitute the moral force of right to the material force of arms. End quote. No truer proposition could be announced. If Germany had put this principle into practice, she never would have violated Belgian territory. 
when England protested against the proposed invasion of Belgium, she did so in obedience to the sacred principle enunciated by the sovereign pontiff. She strongly insisted to the last minute that the moral force of solemn treaties should prevail upon the material force of arms. In a letter dated October 7, 1917, his eminence Cardinal Gaspari, Secretary of State to His Holiness, addressing the Archbishop of Lens, wrote as follows respecting conscription. Quote, the Holy See, in his appeal of the 1st of August, did not consider, out of deference for the leaders of the belligerent peoples, that he should mention it, preferring to leave to themselves the care of determining it, but for him the only practical system, and moreover easy to apply with some good will on both sides, would be the following, to suppress, with one accord between civilized nations, military obligatory service, to constitute an arbitration tribunal, as already said in the pontifical appeal, to settle international questions. Finally, to prevent infractions, to establish universal quote-unquote boycottage, against any nation attempting to re-establish military obligatory service, on refusing either to lay an international question before the arbitration tribunal, or to abide by its decision." Cardinal Gaspari then points to the anti-war British and American systems of military voluntarism in the following terms, quote, As a matter of fact, omitting other considerations, the recent example of England and America testifies in favour of the adoption of this system. England and America had in fact voluntary service, and to take an efficient part in the present war, they were obliged to adopt conscription. It proves that voluntary service well supplies the necessary contingent to maintain public order, and is public order not maintained in England and America just as well, if not better, than in the other nations. But it does not supply the enormous armies required for modern warfare. Consequently, in suppressing, with one accord between civilized nations, obligatory service to replace it by voluntary service, disarmament with all the happy consequences above indicated would be automatically obtained without any perturbation of public order for the last century conscription has been the true cause of calamities which have afflicted society to reach a simultaneous and reciprocal suppression will be the true remedy in fact once suppressed conscription could be re-established only by a law and for such a law even with the present constitution of the central empires parliamentary approbation would be required which approbation would be most improbable for many reasons, and above all on account of the sad experience of the present war. In this way, what is so much desired for the maintenance of agreements would be obtained, the people's guarantee. If, on the other hand, the right to make peace or war was given to the people by way of referendum, or at least to Parliament, peace between nations would be assured, as much at least as it is possible in this world." It should be very gratifying indeed to all the loyal subjects of the British Empire to ascertain from the declarations of Cardinal Gaspari that the Pope is in so complete accord with England on this the most important question to be settled by the future peace treaty. As proved in one of the first chapters of this work, the Government of Great Britain, supported in this course by almost the unanimous opinion of the peoples of the United Kingdom, was the first to suggest the holding of the Hague conferences to consider the best means to adopt to favour the world with the blessings of permanent peace. Their own view, which they forcibly expressed, was that the surest way to reach that much-desired result was to limit the military armaments both on land and sea. For more than twenty years previous to the war they pressed, and even implored, for the adoption of their programme. I have also proved how obdurate Germany was in resisting England's propositions, and her successful intrigues to thwart Great Britain's effort to have them adopted and put into practice. England's policy has not changed. On the contrary, it is more than ever favourable to the limitation, and even to the complete abolition, of armaments, if one or the other can be achieved. It is the principal war-aim of Great Britain, only coming next after her determination to avenge Belgium. The future peace of the world could no doubt be well guaranteed by a large measure of disarmament but it would certainly be much more so if complete abolition could be obtained by an international agreement binding on all nations, with, of course, the allowance of the necessary forces required for the maintenance of interior public order. The whole world can safely depend on the strenuous support of England for either the limitation or the abolition of armaments whenever the question is seriously taken up for consideration. Evidently the problem will be difficult to solve. However, it should not be beyond the resources of statesmanship which assuredly ought to rise superior to all prejudiced aspirations after the terrible ordeal humanity will have experienced during the present war. 
the maintenance of internal public order and permanent preparedness for foreign wars are two very different questions to examine the first can safely be left to the care of every nation sure to attend to it if willing to maintain her authority the second has a much wider scope and will tax the ability of statesmanship to the utmost limit will the great civilized nations decide when the war is over to completely abolish conscription to return to voluntary military service within a very limited organization thus doing away by a bold and single stroke with a system which for more than a hundred years has been the curse of continental europe or will they at least as an initial attempt come to the conclusion to only limit armaments maintaining compulsory service for the reduced strength of the armies if armaments are either abolished or merely reduced will they be so on sea as well as on land i would answer at once of course they should looking at the question from the british standpoint and i can also say from that of the united states it should be easily solved public opinion in great britain and all over the british empire as well as in the united states has always been against conscription in peace times until the present war not exactly foreseeing the full extent of the effort she would be called upon to make england entered into the conflict determined to meet the requirements of her military situation out of the resources of voluntary enlistment canada joining in the struggle did the same both have done wonderfully well during the three first years of the prolonged war i can without the slightest hesitation positively assert that public opinion in the whole british empire and not only in the united states but in the whole of the two american continents is as a matter of principle as much hostile to compulsory military service as it was before the present war and would exult at its complete abolition as one of the happiest results of the gigantic contest still going on it is to be deplored but still it is a fact that great questions of public interest too often cannot be settled solely in conformity with the principles they imply if great britain if the united states if canada could consider the question of conscription exclusively from their own standpoint they would most surely decide at once and with great enthusiasm to abolish the obligatory military service they have adopted only as a last resort under the stress of imperious necessity moreover i have no hesitation to express my own opinion that whatever will be the military system of continental europe after the war the british empire and the united states will certainly not be cursed with permanent conscription they are both so happily situated that in peace times they cannot be called upon to go very extensively into the costly preparedness which the european continental nations will have again to submit themselves to if they are not wise enough to put an end forever to the barbarous militarism they have too long endured for fear of teutonic domination under the worst european situation england with a territorial army of a million men ready to be called to the colours or actually flying them backed by her mighty fleet maintained to its highest state of efficiency could always face any continental enemy and such an army of a ready million of well-trained officers and men voluntary service would easily produce if future conditions would require it canada herself could do her share to prepare for any emergency by reverting to voluntary enlistment but in improving the service so as to produce more immediate efficiency very apparently the united states will come out of the present conflict with flying colors and will dispense with compulsory service under any circumstances in the peace days to follow what then will the continental powers do blessed they will be if they make up their mind to do away once for all with a system which has crushed the people so unmercifully to speak in all frankness i believe it would be almost vain however much desirable it is to indulge in fond hopes of the complete abolition of militarism on the european continent the canker is too deep in the flesh and blood of nations to be extirpated as if by magic such a reversal of conditions grown to extravagant proportions during more than a century will not likely be accomplished at the first stroke let us all hope that at least a good start will be made by a large limitation of armaments which may with time lead to the final achievement for which the whole world would be forever grateful to the almighty i have positively stated that extravagant militarism should be discontinued on sea as well as on land such has been the policy of england for many years past i have proved it by the diplomatic correspondence between great britain and germany and the solemn declarations of all the leading british statesmen for the last quarter of a century how persistingly england has implored germany to agree with her in stopping that ruinous race in the building of war vessels we have seen so the assent nay more the determination of england to adhere to her old and noble policy is a foregone conclusion 
the closing sentence of the last quoted paragraph of cardinal gaspari's letter expresses the opinion that quote, the right to make peace or war should be given to the people by way of referendum or at least to parliament end quote. The system preconized by the eminent cardinal has been in existence in England for a number of years, ever since the day when complete ministerial responsibility was adopted as the fundamental principle of the British Constitution. That system was carried to the letter by Great Britain with regard to her intervention in the present war. The right to declare war and to make peace is one of the most important prerogatives of the British Crown. This prerogative of the Crown, like all the others, is held in trust by the Sovereign for the benefit of the people and exercised by him only upon the advice and responsibility of his ministers. In conformity with this great British constitutional principle, what happened in London in August 1914? The then Prime Minister, Mr. Asquith, in his own name and in those of his colleagues, advised His Majesty King George V to declare war against Germany because she had invaded Belgian territory in violation of the treaties by which these two countries were, in honour bound, to protect Belgium's neutrality they were constitutionally responsible to the imperial parliament and to the people of the united kingdom for their advice to their sovereign in his admirable statement to the british house of commons sir edward grey secretary of state for foreign affairs said quote, i have assured the house and the prime minister has assured the house more than once that if any crisis such as this arose we should come before the house of commons and be able to say to the house that it was free to decide what the british attitude should be that we would have no secret engagement which we should spring upon the house and tell the house that because we had entered into that engagement there was an obligation of honour upon the country end quote. the british house of commons had they considered it to be their duty had the right to disapprove the foreign policy of the cabinet and to censure the ministers for the advice they had given or had decided to give to the sovereign on the other hand the house of commons had the right to approve the stand taken by the government they did so unanimously, and were most admirably supported by the people. I must say that I consider it would be very difficult, if not absolutely impracticable, to have questions of war or peace dealt with by way of referendum. Crises suddenly created lead almost instantly to declarations of war. But this outcome could hardly be so rapidly produced that Parliament could not be called to deal with the emergency how could france have been able to oppose the crushing german invasion in nineteen fourteen if her government and her representative houses had been obliged to wait for the result of a referendum whether she should fight or kneel down but the whole world outside the central empires and their allies witnessed with unbounded delight the spontaneous and unanimous decision of the heroic french nation to fight to the last she threw herself with the most admirable courage against the invading waves of teutonic barbarism and succeeded by the great and glorious Marne victory in forcing them to ebb, thus giving England and the other allies the time necessary to organize and train their armies, which by their united efforts will save civilization from destruction and the world from the threatened German domination. End of chapter 34《Chapter 35 of England, Canada, and the Great War》this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. England, Canada, and the Great War by Louis Georges Desjardins. Chapter thirty five The Intervention of the United States in the War. The hostilities, once opened as the direct consequence of Germany's obduracy, many of the most influential leaders of public opinion in the United States foresaw that the conflict taking such a wide range, the great American Republic was most likely to be, sooner or later, involved in the european struggle they were of two classes those out of office holding for the time no official position were of course not bound to the same careful discretion in judging the daily developments of the military operations and their far-reaching consequences as those who were at the helm of state in appreciating the course followed by the united states since the war commenced it must never be forgotten that if an autocratic empire trampled upon by a domineering military party can be thrown in a minute into a great conflict, a republic like that of our powerful neighbours cannot be dragooned into any hasty action. In a free country, under a responsible government, public opinion is the basis of the success of any important official decision. The political men and the numerous publicists who incessantly called the attention of our neighbours to what was going on in Europe and on the seas, have rendered a great service in moulding public opinion for the grand duty the Republic would eventually be obliged to accomplish. 
having ourselves decided to participate in the war at once after its outbreak and deeply engaged in the task we canadians felt somewhat uneasy about the apparent determination of our neighbours to stand aside and let the european powers settle the ugly question as a rule we were all wishing to see the united states joining with the allies in the fray once again we had some black sheep with us whilst all the loyal canadians were anxiously waiting for the day when they would applaud the american republic's declaration of war against germany our nationalists were getting more nervous at the increasing signs of the growth of public opinion amongst our neighbours against the criminal german cause and the crimes by which the teutons were supporting it their leader mr bourassa was doing his best to persuade the americans that they had much better to remain out of the struggle he expected he would succeed as he had done in the province of quebec in influencing by his erroneous theories many of the french canadian element in the united states the wish being always father to the thought mr bourassa easily came to the conclusion that mr wilson the president of the united states was decidedly opposed to any intervention of the republic in the war and would prevent it at all hazards how prodigal he was of his eulogiums of his advices to the american pacifists with the president as their leader to know one has only to read his newspaper le devoir how disappointed how crestfallen he was when he discovered how much mistaken he had been when mr wilson who had long been waiting for the right hour to strike the blow at the teutonic autocratic attempt at domination rising grandly to the rank of a great statesman supported by the splendid strength of the public opinion he had wisely and skilfully rallied in favour of the decision he had taken was a sad day for our nationalists and their heart-broken leader blind prejudiced as they were meekly pandering to pan-germanism which they considered as the best antidote to the anglo-saxonism they abhor they could not understand that the lusitania horror the slaughtering of hundreds of american citizens in violation of all the principles of international law the crimes of the teutonic submarine campaign more than justified the intervention of the united states in the war what our neighbours have done since they have joined with the allies what they are doing and promise to do is worthy of all admiration like the british empire like france the united states have given the inspiring example of a most enlightened patriotism of a splendid unity of purpose of a boundless confidence in the triumph of the cause of justice and right such a grand spectacle of true national unity offered a striking contrast with the sad exhibition of the narrow nationalism canada has had to endure without however hindering to any appreciable extent our loyal and patriotic effort to help winning the war mr bourassa who had been out of his natural vituperative tune in complimenting mr wilson on his supposed peace proclivities was sure to turn his guns against the president of the republic the moment he boldly and energetically took his stand against german barbarism as exhibited since the beginning of the war mr wilson had especially protested against such outrages as were perpetrated on the seas by teutonic orders he had repeatedly warned the berlin government what the inevitable consequences of such proceedings would be and going to the full length of what friendly relations between two sovereign states could permit had demanded that an end be put to a kind of warfare most formally condemned by international law contrary to all justice to all human notions of civilization when the cup of german iniquities overflowed with new crimes american reprobation was also raised to the high watermark indignation was at the height of its exasperation public opinion had rapidly rallied and ripened at the horrible sight of so many american citizens women and children murdered in mid-ocean their dead bodies floating over the waves and their souls from above crying for vengeance then the president congress statesmen politicians publicists loyal americans numbering almost a hundred million all of one mind of one heart pledged their national honour to avenge the foul deeds of teutonic barbarity and to do their mighty share in rescuing freedom and civilization from the threatening sanguinary cataclysm which was cruelly saddening our times and darkening the prospects of our children how powerfully how grandly how admirably they have kept their word all know the laws necessary to prosecute the war with the utmost vigour were unanimously passed by congress the organization of the manpower of our neighbours has been made on a grand scale the calls to the financial resources of the republic have been patriotically answered by the people who poured out billions and billions of their hard-earned and prudently saved money to support the national cause so closely identified with that of the allies 
besides spending innumerable millions for their own gigantic military effort the united states are lending billions of dollars to their associates in the great struggle to curb down german autocratic criminal ambition the universe as a whole gratefully applauded the magnificent effort of the leading nation of the new world in defending the old continents of europe asia and africa against the new invasion of the huns the only shadow to this ennobling picture is that which our nationalists from this side of the boundary line try to breathe on it expecting that their treacherous whisper will find some echo amongst the french canadian and the german elements of the republic the following lines are a sample of the kind words mr bourassa has addressed to mr wilson the warrior not the pacifist on august thirty nineteen seventeen respecting the answer of the president of the united states to the pope's appeal in favor of peace he wrote in a gentle mood quote, truth and falsehood sincerity and deceit logic and sophism are sporting with gracefulness in this singularly astonishing document one would imagine that the president persuaded that the european governments are playing an immense game of poker having the life of the peoples at stake wanted to go further and to prove to them that at such a game the great american democracy is their master perhaps did he believe that the bluff outbidding would succeed in tearing to pieces the mask of falsehoods of ambiguities and hypocrisy by which the national rulers are blinding the peoples in order to lead them more readily to be slaughtered on perusing such outrageous writing one cannot help being convinced that mr bourassa considers all the distinguished and most patriotic political leaders who for the last four years have guided with so much talent and devotion france the british empire and her allies through the unprecedented crisis they have had to face are a criminal gang of murderers so in mr bourassa's kind opinion when mr wilson and all the members of the two houses of congress with the most admirable unanimity of thought and aspirations called upon the american nation to avenge their countrymen countrywomen and children murdered on the broad sea they were criminally joining with european rulers in a game of bluff going further than all of them in order to tear to pieces the falsehoods and hypocrisy they were using to blind their peoples to the facile acceptance of the slaughtering process a very strange way indeed of unmasking others hypocrisy by being more hypocritical than them all the next day in a second article on the same subject the nationalist leader said quote, since the outbreak of the war more especially since the exhausted peoples have commenced to ask themselves what will be the result of this frightful slaughter the supporters of war to the utmost have tried hard to create the legend that germany wants to impose her political military and economical domination over the whole universe to this first falsehood they add another one still more complete the only way to assure peace they say is to democratize germany austria and all the nations of the globe end quote. two falsehoods no doubt there are but they are not asserted by those who affirm germany's aspiration at universal domination and who believe that if true free democratic institutions were to replace autocratic rule in many countries peace could be much more easily maintained they are circulated by those who deny that such are the two cases whose fault is it if the almost universal opinion outside the central empires and their few allies is that teutonic ambition for many years past has been to dominate the world whose fault is it if for the last forty years autocratic rule has once more proved to be the curse of the nations which it governs and of the peoples it subjugates has not germany only herself to blame if she had respected the eternal principles of divine morals if she had been contented of her lot and mindful of the rights of other nations if she had been guided by the true law that right is above might if she had followed the ever-glorious path of justice she would not be presently under the ban of the civilized world rising in a mighty effort to crush her threatening tyranny out of existence so much the worse for her if she falls a victim to her insane ambitious dreams and to the atrocious crimes they have inspired her to commit in her calamity the nationalist sympathies will avail her very little as they will everywhere meet with the contempt they fully deserve at page one sixteen in a virulent charge mr bourassa says that mr wilson though a passionate and obstinate pedantic of democracy is as much of an autocrat as william of prussia blinded by his fanatical antipathies towards every one and everything directly or indirectly favouring england 
the nationalist leader fails to see any difference between the man who blasphemously claims by divine right the power to hurl his whole empire at the throat of staggering humanity to satisfy his frenzied lust of domination denying to his subjects any say whatever in the matter and the responsible chief of state who holding his temporary functions from the expressed will of the people who trusted him calls upon that same nation to avenge the murder of a large number of her citizens of her women and children and the barbarous crimes committed in violation of her sovereign rights if mr bourassa is conscious of the enormity of the stand he has taken and of the views he has expressed he is indeed much to be blamed if he is not he is greatly to be pitied at page one o nine of his pamphlet entitled the pope arbiter of peace mr bourassa has written the following monstrous proposition after having said that peace must be restored quote unquote, without victory quote, the more the results of the war are null for both sides the more chances there are for the peoples astounded at the frightful uselessness of those monstrous slaughters to protect themselves against a new fit of furious folly to become odious to men war must be barren end quote so mr bourassa has emphatically proclaimed that the war must be barren of any practical results that the extraordinary sacrifices of lives of resources of wealth must be without reward of any kind that the world must return to the anti-war conditions and this he asserts would be the best means of preventing a renewal of the monstrous slaughters which have been the outcome of germany's horrible attempt at dominating an enslaved humanity in all sincerity it is very difficult to suppose that the exponent of such outrageously abominable views is conscious of what he says a red-hot pacifist mr bourassa clamoured as best he could for peace without victory claiming that it was the only kind of peace that could be just and durable the time was when he pretended surely without any show of reason that such was the sort of peace mr wilson wanted and suggested even as far back as december thirty one nineteen fifteen mr bourassa no doubt desirous of giving full vent to his new year's wishes to all had written quote, in spite of the lies of the impudent bluff of the sanguinary appeals and of the false promises of victory of the partisans of war to excess in all the warring countries popular good sense commences to discern truth the more victory the issue will be materially null and sterile for all the nations at war the more chances there will be that peace will be lasting and that the peoples will be convinced that war is not only an abominable crime but an incommensurable folly End quote. evidently it had already become a hobby on the brain of the nationalist leader he dogmatically proclaims that war between peoples not the wars formerly fought by mercenary armies is a crime abominable and a folly incommensurable true it is on the part of a state tramping upon all the principles of justice and of international law to gratify her guilty ambition but honourable glorious is war on the part of peoples rising in their patriotic might to resist a sanguinary enemy to defend their countries their homes their mothers their wives and their children from oppression to stem the conquering efforts of barbarous invaders no doubt it was a crime on the part of germany to break her pledged honour by solemn treaties and to violate belgium's territory no doubt it was a crime for germany and one abominable to overrun belgium spreading everywhere desolation devastation incendiarism murder but can it be said that the admirable and heroic resistance belgium has opposed to her tyrannical invaders was a dastardly crime no doubt it was a crime and one most abominable for germany to order the sinking of the lusitania and hundreds of merchant ships without the warning required by the law of nations murdering by hundreds non-combatants children women and old men but can any one be justified in asserting that after exhausting for the redress of such abominable wrongs all the resources of diplomacy the united states were committing a crime when they accepted the criminal teutonic challenge and decided to join with the british empire with france italy and their allies to rescue human freedom and civilization from the impending destruction it is an aberration of mind incommensurable in depth for a publicist or any one else to be so blinded by prejudices so lost to all sense of justice as to place on the same footing on the same level the assailant and he who defends his all the murderer and the victim 
I positively affirm that I am not actuated by the least ill-will or ill-feeling against the Nationalist leader, in judging his course and his views as I do. Thank God I know enough of the teachings of Christianity to wish good to all men. But I cannot help being deeply sorry and deploring that one of my French-Canadian compatriots is buried in such mental darkness as to be unable to perceive the difference, incommensurable, there is in the present war between the hideous Teutonic guilt and the commendable and meritorious defence by the allied nations of the most sacred cause on earth, outraged justice. And with all sincerity I express the profound wish that during the prolonged recess the timely war measure adopted to censure and prevent all utterances detrimental to the best Canadian effort in the conflict, the nationalist leader has the pleasure to enjoy, he will reconsider the whole situation and his opinions, too much widely circulated. Is it yet possible to hope that, at last, he will see the dawn which will lead him to the full light with which the great and noble cause of his country and of the world is shining? It is no surprise that such opinions utterly fail to have any echo among the liberty-loving people of the neighbouring republic. They died their merited shameful death before crossing over the boundary line, buried deep under the heap of the profound feelings of reprobation they provoked. The nationalist leader even missed the mark where he felt sure his shot would strike. We can rest assured that the large majority of the United States Germans, by birth or origin, would not change the responsible president of their new country for the autocrat Kaiser from whose absolutist power so many of them fled to breathe freely in the new land of promise it was their happy lot to enter. Mr. Bourassa met with a complete failure in his expectation to arouse the feelings of his compatriots over the frontier against the intervention of the Republic in the war. It has been a profound satisfaction for us, French Canadians, to learn that from the very moment war was declared by the Republic against Germany, the French Canadian element in the United States has been to the forefront of the most loyal of our friendly neighbours in fighting the common enemy. The French Canadians of the United States, either by birth or origin, have wisely turned a deaf ear to the nationalist leader's seductive but prejudiced theories, to the wild charges he was wont to level at all the national rulers of the Allies, and, as a final attempt, at those of the American Republic. They have rallied to their colours with enthusiastic patriotism. They have nobly done their duty. They are doing it, and will continue to do so to the last, to the final victory for which they are fighting with the patriotic desire to share in the glory of the triumph of their country. End of chapter 35《Chapter 36 of England, Canada, and the Great War》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. England, Canada, and the Great War by Louis-Georges Desjardins Chapter 36 The Allies, Russia, Japan Since its outbreak, the Great War has, and before it is over, will have, played havoc in many ways in the wide world. Criminal aspirations have been quashed, extravagant hopes shattered, an ancient throne overthrown almost without a clash, an autocrat sovereign murdered, another forced to abdicate and go into exile. In the open airs, on land, over the waves, under sea, the fighting demon has been most actively at work, ordering one of the belligerent, eager to obey, to spare no one, young, weak, or old. Death has been dropped from the skies on sleeping non-combatants, assassinating right and left. On the soil providentially provided with the resources necessary to human life, homes have been ruined, their so far happy owners brutally murdered. On the ocean the treacherous and barbarous submariner, operating in the broad light of the day or in the darkness of the night, has sent without remorse to the fathomless bottom thousands and thousands of innocent victims, children, women, old men, wounded soldiers spared on land but drowned at sea. Viewed from the height of a much nobler standpoint, the war has developed a superior degree of heroism perhaps never equalled. Belgians, Serbians, Poles, Armenians have endured and are still suffering their prolonged martyrdom with a fortitude deserving the greatest admiration. The nations united to withstand the torrent of German cruel and depraved ambition are writing, with the purest of their blood, pages of history which, for all times to come, will offer to posterity unrivalled examples of the sound and unswerving patriotism which has elevated them all to the indomitable determination to bear patiently, perseveringly, all the sacrifices, in lives courageously given, 
in resources profusely spent, in taxation willingly accepted and paid, in works of all kinds cheerfully performed, which the salvation of human liberty and civilization shall require. The collapse of the ancient and hitherto mighty empire of Russia will undoubtedly be one of the most startling events of the great war. For the present I shall not comment on the causes of this momentous episode, incidental to the wonderful drama being played on the worldly stage, more than I have done in a previous chapter. Still the important change it has made in the respective situation of the belligerents, with the prospective consequences likely to follow, one way or the other, calls for some timely consideration. Evidently, the downfall first of the imperial regime, second of the de facto republican government by which it was replaced, throwing the great eastern ally of Great Britain, France, and Italy under the tyrannical sway of the Bolsheviki's terrorists, most considerably altered the relative strength of the fighting power of the belligerents. Very detrimental to the Allies, it was largely favourable to the Central Empires. The Triple Entente, as first constituted, was much weakened by the desertion of one of the great partners in the heavy task they had undertaken, whilst the Triple Alliance was strengthened in a relative proportion, at least for the time being, and the very near future. Evidence, incontrovertible, is coming to light, proving what had been soundly presumed, that Bolshevikism was not merely the result, as in other instances, of the violence of sanguinary revolutionists overpowering a regular progressive movement of political freedom and reform, but that it has been the outcome of German intrigue easily succeeding in corrupting into shameless treason the Bolsheviki's leaders. As a sovereign state, as an independent nation, Russia was, in honour bound, pledged not to consent to a separate peace, and to make peace with Germany only with conditions to which all the Allies would agree acceptance of and concurrence in all peace agreements were the essential clause of the pledge great britain france and russia had reciprocally taken in going to war with the central empires with this sacred pledge italy concurred fully on joining the allies to that solemn pledge the american republic has emphatically assented when she threw her weighty sword in the balance against blood-stained and murderous germany the bolsheviki's treacherous government repudiated the solemn engagement of their country threw her honour to the winds, sold her dearest national interests by the infamous Brest-Litovsk Treaty. Betrayed Russia was out of the war, leaving her allies to their fate. From a military point of view, the consequences were easily foreseen. Freed from the danger of further attacks on the eastern front, both Germany and Austria could send their eastern armies, the first on the western front in France, the second on the Italian front. Germany, only requiring a sufficient force to keep down trodden Russia, under the yoke treacherously fastened on her neck by the traitors who had ignominiously sold their country to her enemy, and anxious to profit to the utmost by her success in coercing the Russians to agree to dishonourable peace conditions, hurried more than a million men over to the western front. Austria did likewise, sending a large force with the hope of smashing the Italians out of the fight. Those were no doubt very anxious days. All remember how the Italian army lost in a very short time all the ground they had so stubbornly conquered. Germany made formidable preparations to strike, in the very early spring of the present year, a decisive blow by which she fully expected to reach and take Paris. We shall never forget the feverish hours we lived when came the successive reports of the crushing advance of the Teutonic hordes so close to the illustrious capital of France. For a while it seemed to be, and really it was, a renewal of the first terrific invasion of northern France in 1914. Fortunately, it was providentially decreed that the second onslaught was to meet with a second mound disaster. The Huns were forced to retire after a tremendous loss of men and war materials, the Allied armies, brilliantly led and fighting heroically, redeeming all the lost territory, and at the moment I am writing, moving steadily towards the German frontier the great good luck of the Allies, treasonably sacrificed by the Russian Bolsheviki's terrorist government, was the solemn entry of the United States into the European conflict. Preparing for the grand effort which she confidently expected would be final, Germany rashly decided to resume her barbarous submarine campaign, positively determined to criminally violate all the principles of international law regulating warfare on the seas. That outrageous decision was her fatal doom." Its direct result was to bring the American Republic into the war. And then the whole world was called upon to witness, with unbounded delight, the very impressive spectacle of millions of fighting free men, 
being successfully transported over the sea and landed on the french soil to join the grand army which for the last four years had been resisting the full might of the autocratic forces however difficult it is to foretell what the political developments of the present deplorable russian situation will be still it is not illusory to believe that history once more repeating itself the present sanguinary russian regime will hasten its well-deserved ignominious downfall by the very brutal excesses it multiplies in its delirious tyranny there are too many elements of the immense population of russia favorable to an orderly and sensible government to suppose that they will long fail to gather their strength in order to redeem their country's honor and to remove from power the traitors who are the shame of their fair land when the infallible reaction sets in it will increase the more in momentum that it will have longer been repressed by foul means the most important point of the present russian situation to consider is that of the best initiative the allies could and ought to take respecting the military question many are of opinion that it would be possible for the allies to help russia out of the present difficulties by an armed support such views have been more especially expressed in the united states could they or can they be carried out i must say that in a large measure i share the opinion of those who would give an affirmative answer to the question it is well known that the matter has been most seriously considered by the allies and a favorable solution seems on the way of a satisfactory realization to the armed intervention of the allies in russia following closely upon the infamous brest litovsk peace treaty there was a very serious obstacle of german creation it was evident at the very start that if intervention there was to be the one ally to play the most important part in the great undertaking would be japan the british statesmen who several years ago brought about the treaty of alliance between great britain and japan have deserved much from the empire and from the world generally surely they had a clear insight of the future true to her treaty obligations japan at once sided with great britain in the war all those who have closely followed the trend of events since the outbreak of the hostilities know how much japan has done to assist in chasing the german military and mercantile fleets from the high seas more especially from the pacific ocean canada owes her a debt of gratitude for the protection she has afforded our western british columbia coast from the raids of german warships foreseeing that the proximity of japan to eastern russia was an inducement for the allies to decide upon an armed intervention which starting from siberia might roll westward over the broad lands leading back to the european eastern front germany lost no time in trying to poison russian public opinion against the japanese her numerous representatives and agents told the russians that if they allowed japan to send her army on russian territory they would be doomed to fall under japanese sway they recalled the still recent russo-japanese war amplifying the supposed aims of japan so as to stir up the national feelings of the russians such a cry assiduously and widely spread was no doubt a dangerous one under those circumstances japan wisely decided to remain in the expectation of further developments before moving she took the safe stand that she would intervene only upon the request of the russians themselves pledging her word of honor that her only purpose would be to free russia from german domination and that she would withdraw from russian territory as soon as complete russian independence would have been restored and the treacherous teutonic aims foiled evidences are increasing in number and importance that the hun's propaganda in russia against japan is being successfully counteracted by the good sense of the people realizing how much their vital national interests have been trampled upon by germany in imposing her peace conditions on their country betrayed by the bolsheviki rulers an armed allied force has been sent to and has been for some weeks operating in siberia so far with commendable results for one i have most at heart an expectation which i would be most happy to see realized it seems to me that there ought to be a chance nay more a possibility for the allies to organize between this day and next spring a strongly supported intervention in russia in that event japan of course would take the lead she could rapidly send to help the russians to resume their part in the war against germany at least a million of men two millions if they were needed as a guarantee of japan's good faith the allies more especially the united states could send over contingents to siberia there is no doubt whatever that so supported the revulsion of russian public feeling once set in motion would soon overwhelm the bolshevikis a sensible and patriotic government once at the helm of the state could easily and rapidly reorganize a powerful army out of the numerous available millions 
the financial aspect of the question would certainly be the most difficult for russia to meet after the exhaustive strain she has had to bear but however great their moneyed effort the united states could yet do a great deal to help russia financially will the hopes of so many be realized and will russia resuming her place of honor in the glorious ranks of the allies be found battling once more with them when together they will finally crush the german tyrannical militarism god only knows and time will tell End of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of england canada and the great war this librivox recording is in the public domain england canada and the great war by louis georges desjardins chapter thirty seven the last peace proposals i was writing the last pages of this work when the surprising news was flashed over the cable that austria-hungary had taken the initiative of suggesting peace discussion which proposition she had communicated to all the belligerents to the neutral governments and even to the holy see without delay the rumour proved to be true the very next day the full text of austria's communication was published all over the world i have read it with great care and i confess with profound amazement from several standpoints this document is astonishing and weighty astonishing as it reveals more than ever before the astuteness of the inspiration which dictated it weighty because it derives its importance from one of the most serious situation of the world's affairs ever recorded in history it is difficult to suppose that the austrian government really expected that their move would be considered as the outcome of their own initiative not the hand but the sword the dominating sword behind the throne is clearly visible the carefully drafted document issued from vienna was evidently dictated from berlin it is stamped with the teutonic seal after the experience of the last four years i can safely say of the last half century as well over credulous is he who believes that swayed as she has been by her overpowering northern neighbour austria would have dared to address such a proposition to the allies if she had not been asked by germany to do so it is rather amusing to read the news cabled from amsterdam holland on the twentieth of september that an official communication issued in berlin said that the german ambassador in vienna that day presented germany's reply to the recent austro-hungarian peace note the purport of the note was that germany agreed to participate in the proposed exchange of views this is indeed high-class cynicism the document would certainly call for somewhat lengthy and strong comments but they can be dispensed with after the curt sharp and decisive reply it has elicited from those it was intended to seduce and deceive president wilson was the first to answer a positive a formidable no which thundered out from washington was echoed with equal force in london paris and rome so that the astute attempt to deter the allies from the glorious course they were forced to adopt by germany and by austria herself was doomed to failure and bound to meet with the contempt it deserved but a few remarks expressing the retort that strikes one's mind on reading the austrian communication are in order and had better be made the whole stress of the document is that peace should be restored as soon as possible on account of the sacrifices and sufferings war nowadays entail and in conformity with unanimous wishes of the peoples engaged in the conflict did austria ever suppose that when she addressed that sadly famous and outrageous ultimatum to servia dated the twenty third of july nineteen fourteen which she well knew would bring about the cataclysm she now feigns to deplore and which germany and herself were longing for the war would be only a child's play a game of golf or something of the kind was austria at that time cherishing the kind feelings of the german consprince who on being asked by an american lady in a social event at berlin why he was so desirous of seeing a great war replied that quote, it was only for the fun of the thing end quote that war when once declared would have terrible consequences would cost millions of dear lives would cripple many more millions for the rest of their earthly days would cost innumerable millions even billions of hard-earned money would destroy an immense amount of accumulated wealth would delay for years the onward march of humanity towards more and more prosperous destinies was not only foreseen before it broke out but was positively known to be pregnant with all such disasters but what was not foreseen not known nor imagined as at all possible after nearly twenty centuries of christianity was that war being on germany the power responsible for it guilty of the crime of having let loose the frightful hurricane would multiply the horrors inseparable from military operations 
with unconceivable barbarous acts condemned by all international, moral, and divine laws. It was not foreseen, nor supposed possible, that heroism would be challenged by murder, that the glorious defenders of their country's rights would have to fight against sanguinary savages obeying the barbarian orders of a modern Attila. It was not foreseen that hundreds of children, women, old men, wounded soldiers, would be assassinated on the open sea and sent to their eternal watery graves. So far as the horrors of regular warfare were concerned, they were, as I have just said, very well known. And was it not on account of this knowledge that Great Britain and France had exhausted all their efforts in favour of the maintenance of peace? Was it not out of this knowledge that England had, for more than twenty years, implored the Berlin government to agree at least to partial disarmament? to discontinue, or at the least, to reduce warship-building operations. When Austria, bowing herself down to the ground under the German tyrannical lash, unjustly and cruelly declared war against weak Servia, she knew what the horrors of the conflict could not fail to be. How is it that at that time she was not moved by the sympathetic feelings expressed in her recent appeal for peace negotiations? How is it that Austria and her inspiring angel, Germany, are getting so nervous about the misfortunes of war just at the time when they are forced to admit that they are utterly unable to realize the aims for which they brought on the frightful struggle? How is it that those who could order with clear conscience and fiendish delight the violation of Belgium-guaranteed neutrality, the sinking of the Lusitania and so many other ships carrying non-combatants, children, women, and old men, the murder of so many innocent victims, the Belgian deportations, the destruction of the monuments of art, the work of human genius, are suddenly moved to pity just as they see the handwriting on the wall warning them that their days of foul enjoyments are at end. How is it that the voice who dictated the following sentence was not silenced and choked by the abominable lie it contains? How is it that the hand that wrote it was not instantly dried up at the impudent falsehood it expresses? Austria's official communication says in part, quote, The central powers leave it in no doubt that they are only waging a war of defense for the integrity and the security of their territories. End quote. But why is it that the central empires are now only waging a defense of war, if it is not because after having opened the game with the certainty of crushing their opponents by the tremendous power of their formidable military organization, they are getting beaten and overpowered by the unrivalled heroism called forth by their criminal attempt at destroying weak nations and enslaving humanity. The Austrian and German governments willfully forget that the important point is not to consider who are the belligerents that are now forced by the fortune of arms to wage a defensive struggle. It is to ascertain who started the conflict of an offensive war. To that question the voice of the truly civilized world has answered with no uncertain sound. It was given, and ever since most energetically emphasized, the very day the first Austrian shot was fired at Belgrade, the first thundering German gun and the first German soldier ordered to cross over the Belgian frontier. The Austrian tentative peace document pretends, quote, that all peoples, on whatever side they may be fighting, long for a speedy end to the bloody struggle, end quote. This is so evidently true that the writer of the communication might very properly have dispensed with asserting it. But have the Austrian and the German governments forgotten that the peoples were equally longing for the maintenance of peace during the many years of intense war preparation prior to the outbreak of the hostilities in 1914? If they are not yet aware of it, the central empires must be taught that the Allied nations have another longing than that for peace, to which they have given precedence and for which they will continue to fight strenuously until it is fully gratified. They long for an honourable, a just and lasting peace. They long to see once more the old landmarks of civilization and political liberty emerging safe and radiant from the waves of Teutonic barbarism. They long, and most earnestly, for peace restored under such conditions as will put an end to extravagant, ruinous, and autocratic militarism, which will henceforth relieve the peoples from the drastic obligation of maintaining, at a cost more and more crushing, an ever-increasing military organization for fear of being suddenly subjugated by an ambitious foe bent on dominating the world. Using the very words of the most admirable speech addressed by President Wilson to the United States Congress, on the 11th of February last, the Allied nations long for a peace which will provide, quote, that peoples and provinces are no longer to be bartered about from sovereignty to sovereignty 
as if they were mere chattels and pawns in a game, even the great game now for ever discredited of the balance of power, but that every territorial settlement involved in this war must be made in the interest and for the benefit of the populations concerned, and not as a part of any mere adjustment or compromise of claims amongst rival states." The Allied peoples are longing for a peace by which, quote, all well-defined national aspirations shall be accorded the utmost satisfaction that can be accorded them without introducing new or perpetuating old elements of discord, and antagonism that would be likely in time to break the peace of Europe and consequently of the world. End quote. The pacifists of the Allied nations who have, like the nationalist leader and his henchmen in the province of Quebec, clamoured for peace by compromise, must have had a few hours of delightful enjoyment after reading Austria's communication. It is evidently the echo of their oft-repeated views, and has been carefully drafted to stir them to further exertions, in favour of a settlement which will gratify their ill-disguised Teutonic sympathies. Austria's document is a plea intended to be strong for peace by negotiations irrespective of the war situation and its probable result. This is the kind of peace dear to the heart of the nationalist leader and his friends. The newspaper Le Devoir is their daily organ in Montreal. A Sunday paper called Le Nationaliste is the weekly edition of the daily organ. By what mysterious inspiration was Le Nationaliste able to forestall the publication of the Austrian peace document by an article in its issue of Sunday, the 13th of August, which summarizes the leading reasons given by the government of Vienna to induce the Allied governments to agree, quote, to a confidential and unbinding discussion, end quote of the conditions of peace, quote, at a neutral meeting-place, end quote. Since the official publication of the document, our nationalists, who had been subdued by the order in council, tightening the censure of disloyal writings and speaking, and reduced to the necessity of merely whispering their fond hopes of an early peace, which would relieve the central empires, Turkey and Bulgaria, from the deserved chastisement of their crimes, are getting again more outspoken in the expression of their views and of their Teutonic proclivities the street-corner propaganda is being resumed with more discreet vigour than formerly when loud talk was considered safe. New efforts, better guarded against a compromising responsibility to instil the virus in the body politic, are tried over again. They creep in a few newspapers well known for their hardly disguised hostility to the cause of the Allies and to the participation of Canada to its defence. All this under the hypocritical cover of a longing for the restoration of peace and the cessation of the sacrifices the country is still making for the victory for which all loyal British subjects are praying and doing their best to secure. Germany has prudently, cowardly is the more proper word, remained behind, satisfied for the time being to play the part of prompter to her vassal Austria. But however desirous of remaining free to repudiate publicly, if considered more advisable, Austria's move, she could not help showing her hand. She betrayed herself by the peace offer she has had the outrageous audacity to make to Belgium she has barbarously crucified. And what are the terms of this astonishing proposal? I will mention only two of them. First, quote, that Belgium shall remain neutral until the end of the war. End quote. That Germany should have decided to address such a demand to Belgium is truly inconceivable has she forgotten the days when belgium was neutral and determined to remain so under the joint protection of england france and germany bound by solemn treaty to uphold belgian independence does she not realize that if belgium has not been neutral up to this day she has been the cause of it in tearing to pieces the scrap of paper which should have been the sacred shield of the nation she criminally martyred after having violated Belgium's frontier, overrun her territory, destroyed her happy homes, murdered by thousands her children, her women, her mothers, her old men, ransomed her to the tune of hundreds of millions, without granting her liberty, shattered her monuments of arts, she has the impudence to ask her to betray those who hasten to her defence, and who are pledged to require the restoration of her complete independence with due reparation as one of the essential conditions of peace a more brazen outrage cannot be imagined. It is on a par with that address to England whose neutrality Germany wanted to secure at the cost of her honour in betraying France. What was the true object of Germany in making such a proposition? Was it not to protect herself against the increasing likelihood that the Allied army would soon be able to enter on German soil by passing through Belgium? But in that event, so much to be hoped for, there would be that difference that whilst Germany invaded Belgium in sheer violation of her solemn treaty obligations, 
france england and the united states would honour themselves in turning the guilty invaders out of the soil they have sullied by their hideous presence and their horrible savageness the second german peace proposition to belgium reads as follows quote, that belgium shall use her good offices to secure the return of the german colonies end quote. and such a request is made by the power that in spite of the treaties it was in honour bound to respect ordered the german army to conquer belgium in a dastardly rush in order to reach france at once and crush her out of the conflict before she could be helped by great britain and her colonies incredible indeed germany and austria knew very well that their proposals would be indignantly and contemptuously rejected but they had a twofold object in making them first they wanted to stir up their own peoples to further efforts in carrying on the struggle by throwing upon the allies the apparent responsibility of refusing even a confidential and unbinding discussion of the question of the restoration of peace second they were anxious to make a strong bid for the support of the pacifists of the allied countries how much will they succeed in galvanizing the enthusiasm of their peoples for another grand effort remains to be seen so far as their attempt to move our pacifists to exert themselves in favor of a peace by compromise it has already met with a complete failure our nationalist pacifists are getting so few and so far between that they will most likely once more disappear and give up the street propaganda. On completing the reading of the official communication of Austria, President Wilson at once gave his reply, authorizing the Secretary of State to issue the following statement, dated the 16th of September, and published broadcast on the next day. Quote, I am authorized by the President to state that the following will be the reply of this government to the Austro-Hungarian note proposing an unofficial conference of belligerents. The government of the United States feels that there is only one reply which it can make to the suggestion of the imperial Austro-Hungarian government. It has repeatedly and with entire candor stated the terms upon which the United States would consider peace, and can and will entertain no proposal for a conference upon a matter concerning which it has made its position and purpose so plain on the eleventh day of february nineteen eighteen president wilson instead of addressing as usual a message to the two houses went personally to meet the senate and the house of representatives in congress assembled and in a most admirable speech replied to the then recent peace utterances of count von hertling the german chancellor and count cernin the austro-hungarian foreign minister fully explaining the only principles by which the government of the united states would be guided when peace negotiations do take place this most important statement is published as an appendix to this book it is worthy of the great statesman who made it and deserves the most attentive reading on account of the lofty views and noble principles it expresses of the large issues it involves and of the ardent patriotism it inspires the prime ministers of great britain and france have signified their entire assent to the energetic stand taken by president wilson in the above quoted reply to austria's peace communication the whole british empire france the united states and italy are a unit in refusing to consider for a moment austria's cynical peace proposals belgium from the cross of martyrdom to which the hun's barbarity has nailed her has summoned all her wonderful courage in her long and cruel agony to repudiate with scorn the infamous German proposition to betray those who are pledged to be her saviours. Consequently, the peace offensive, so cleverly planned by Germany, and opened by her contemptible Austrian satellite, has met with as dismal a failure as the military offensive launched on the twenty-first day of March last, with such superior numerical forces and unbounded confidence that this gigantic effort would at last smash the Allies' resistance. Just as the Teutonic hordes are hurled back by the matchless strategy of the chief commander of the Allied armies and their incomparable heroism, the Austrian peace offensive communication is returned to their authors a miserable scrap of paper. And the grand and noble fight will go on until Germany is brought to her knees and forced to recognize that, quote, the resources of civilization are not yet exhausted, end quote. The modern Huns are doomed to a very sad awakening from their dream of universal domination. Germany has challenged the world to a deadly struggle. She must bear the consequences, however sad they may be. Four years ago, anticipating a crushing victory, she exulted over the early fall of her enemies, madly certain that in a few weeks they would kneel down crying for mercy. She trusted her all to the fortunes of war. They will at last go against her. She would have been cruelly triumphant. Will she be cowardly in defeat? Austria has blindly served Germany's criminal ambition. She must abide by the result of her blindness. 
both carried away by passion, they forgot that there would be a terrible reckoning day for their atrocious crime. It is near at hand, and they cannot avoid being called to a severe account for their foul deeds. Kaiser Wilhelm II will soon find out that divine justice is very different from what he fondly believed. He will receive the proper answer to his blasphemous appeals to the Almighty to bless with success his guilty ambition to dominate the world. He will learn that from above the innocent victims whom he has mercilessly sacrificed to his lust of autocratic power have cried for vengeance and have been heard. He bears the guilt of blood and sacrilegious war. He shall receive his deserts in due time. End of chapter 37《Chapter 38 of England, Canada, and the Great War》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. England, Canada, and the Great War by Louis-Georges Desjardins Chapter 38 — Necessary Peace Conditions It can be positively affirmed that, taking no account whatever of the treasonable views of the defeatists, and no more of the disloyal opinions of the pacifists, because they only deserve absolute contempt and reprobation, the peoples called the Allies have been long ago are now, and will remain to the last, unanimous on the essential peace conditions without which all the sacrifices they have made, and are making, would be a total irreparable loss. It has been proclaimed with the highest authority, and universally approved, that henceforth peace must be just and durable. Such it should always have been. The principle is no doubt very easily enunciated. It is applauded by all and everywhere, even by Germany and Austria. The great, the insuperable difficulty is to agree upon such conditions as will permanently, and to the complete satisfaction of all concerned, bless the world with the maintenance of a truly just and durable peace. It is better to admit at once that the very moment the question is considered, the presently contending belligerents are as far apart as the two poles of the earthly globe. It is extremely easy to prove it. No one now ignores, or at least should fail to realize, what kind of peace would be accepted by Germany as just and durable. To be satisfied with a settlement of peace, Germany would require the sanction by her opponents of her right to maintain, develop, and strengthen her militarism so threatening to the universe. At the time she was exulting over the great and crushing victory which she was sure to have within her powerful grasp, in debating with her vanquished enemies the conditions of peace, Germany, elated as she would certainly have been by her triumph, would have positively claimed the annexation of Belgium and of all the northern part of France by right of conquest. She would not have been less exacting than she was in 1870, when in the face of indignant but powerless Europe she stripped France of her two fine and wealthy provinces, Alsace and Lorraine. She would have claimed the right to supersede England as mistress of the seas, German supremacy replacing the British and henceforth ruling the waves she would have claimed the annexation of Russian Poland and that of Servia to Austria. She would have claimed the recognition of her imperial paramount power over the Balkans, which she would have united under the direct sway of her ally and vassal, Bulgaria. Victorious over all continental Europe and equally over Great Britain, she would most likely have claimed the cession to her of the great British autonomous colonies for the purpose of pouring over to Canada, Australia and South Africa her increasingly overflowing population and to better achieve that most coveted result, she would have destroyed at once the free institutions they enjoy under the British crown, to replace them by her autocratic rule. In one of his illogical pamphlets, abounding in extravagant views, the nationalist leader has denied with scorn that Germany had ever intended to acquire Canada by force of arms. He supported his assertion by the declaration made to the contrary by a German minister, but he failed to explain that this German public man said so only when the Berlin government had fully realized that they could not succeed in breaking asunder the mighty British Empire. The Teutonic Declaration was hypocritical, intended to deceive and to supply our nationalist pacifists with what would seem a plausible argument to cover their sympathies for the gentle cause of the tender-hearted Huns. It is very easy to disclaim any aspiration to possess what one is sure never to get triumphant Germany would have bargained very hard to lay her powerful hand on the great Indian Empire. She would have dismembered Russia, as she has effectively done, at least temporarily, by the infamous Brest-Litovsk Treaty. She would have strongly supported Austria in destroying forever Italy's legitimate aspirations to round off her national territory by the annexation of that part of Austria's possessions called the Trentino, which is hers by nature. 
Following the precedent she had laid down in 1870, after her triumph over France, Germany would undoubtedly have exacted from her fallen enemies billions and billions of dollars as indemnities of war. And Germany, with such a peace treaty imposed to her despairing enemies with her sanguinary sword at their throat, ready to murder them, as she did at Brest-Litovsk, would have swayed the world with her universal domination. But I hear, I must say without being the least frightened, the thundering clamour of the nationalist leader crying that Germany does not now claim such peace conditions as above enumerated. Very true, and why? Only because she is no longer able to exact and impose them. In 1914, Germany being victorious over all Europe, England included, after a four months overpowering campaign, as she expected, would certainly not have been satisfied with less than the conditions just specified. They were the goal for which she had been strenuously preparing for fifty years, her success in 1870 being the preliminary opening of her conquests. To bring Germany to renounce, temporarily, to her fond hopes of domination, it has required the heroic efforts and the untold sacrifices, in men and money, which Great Britain, her colonial empire, France, Italy, Belgium, Japan, betrayed Russia, and last but not least, the United States, have made during more than the last four years, and which they are pledged to make until a successful issue. The kind of peace as above would have been what can be very properly called Germany's offensive peace. In Germany's opinion, this would have been the just and durable peace dear to her so kind heart. But having failed to carry the tremendous victory for which she had so powerfully prepared, Germany would now likely agree to negotiate what can be as properly called a defensive peace. By defensive peace, I mean Germany negotiating now with her opponents with the determination to repulse, as much as possible, their just claims, to prevent them to the utmost limit to reap the legitimate fruits of their admirable endeavours, to thwart the realization of their noble aspirations to protect the world hereafter against her guilty and barbarous militarism. Germany, I mean of course the Teutonic imperial government, has yet given no sign of a change of mind on the vital points at stake in the consideration of the restoration of peace. If the fortune of arms was once more to favor her armies, her blood stained for colors, she would to-morrow be as mercilessly exacting as she would have been in 1914, had she triumphantly entered Paris inside of two months after her challenge to the civilized world. Germany is surely not a convert to sound Christian principles. She will not repent for her crimes. She does not feel the tortures of remorse at her foul deeds. She would certainly be a relapser in the near future if the Allies, unwisely heeding the clamor of the pacifists, imprudently gratified her actual wish for a peace compromise and before long humanity would be forced to go again, in much aggravated conditions, over the way of the cross she has been threading along for nearly five years, steeped to the knees in the blood of millions of her heroic sons, with a reorganized Germany, this time straining all the Huns' accumulated power to lead civilization to her cavalry. With God's grace that shall not be. Five years of martyrdom have deserved and will receive justice." After having explained what Germany, from her standpoint, considers a just and durable peace, let us see what such a peace means from the Allies' standpoint. Every free man has a right to his own opinion. However, he must never forget that liberty of opinion does not mean, never meant, absence of knowledge, ignorance of the basic principles of political society. I do not hesitate to expound what the real conditions of the coming peace must be to make it just and durable. Let the inveterate opponents of political liberty say what they please, it is undeniable that the present war has rapidly developed into a deadly conflict between autocratic power and political freedom. Consequently, a peace patched up to uphold autocracy and destroy free institutions could not be just and durable. Under the dominating circumstances of the present struggle, to bring it to a satisfactory conclusion, peace, to be just and durable, must be restored with all the necessary guarantees that political liberty will hereafter be safe against the foul attempts of military despotism. This sine qua non condition is general in its nature, and equally interests all the contending allied nations. Let us now consider the peace conditions which, though of general importance so far as they are necessary for its permanency, are essential from the particular standpoint of each one of the Allies separately. I shall begin the review by considering the particular case of Great Britain. To be just and durable for the British Empire, the future peace treaty must not be so drafted as to supersede British sea supremacy by that of Germany. 
the question of what is to be done with the great german african colonies conquered by the south african dominion army is next in importance to england's sea supremacy from the british empire standpoint germany very far from foreseeing what was to happen deliberately opened that question when she precipitated the present conflict by coercing austria to crush weak servia herself challenging russia and france and thundering at belgium in violation of her most sacred treaty obligations great britain as in honour bound standing by belgium was forced to fight with germany the great autonomous colonies nobly rallying to her support the south african dominion boers and british admirably united for the purpose undertook for her share to conquer the german african colonies she has grandly succeeded if as we all hope the allies are finally victorious would it be just to relinquish great britain's right over the german african colonies more especially if the south african dominion is strongly opposed as there is no doubt she will be to their retrocession and what about belgium and france no peace treaty could be called just nor could be durable which would not completely restore belgium's independence which would not oblige germany to indemnify belgium for the damages wrought upon her more especially those which were inflicted to the belgian weak but heroic nation out of sheer barbarous destruction to france the northern part of her presently occupied territory together with alsace and lorraine must be restored the germans are loudly crying that in exacting the restoration to france of the provinces of alsace and lorraine the allies would be partly dismembering the german empire quite so and why not does the victim of the highwayman lose the right to claim his property from the ruffian who has stolen it by brutal force in eighteen seventy under the circumstances all know prussia imposed upon france the cession of alsace and lorraine rounding off the territory of the new german empire france naturally smarted under the cruelty of the condition which she could not help accepting for many years she cherished the hope that the lost provinces would ultimately return to the parental home but it is well known how time is an efficient cure of many ills france's yearning for the restoration of alsace and lorraine had gradually subsided the general opinion was spreading that the alsace lorraine matter was more and more becoming a finally settled question before the war no power european or american would have countenanced france in any attempt to break peace to run her chance of reconquering alsace and lorraine france knew it perfectly well and at last bowed to her fate who has reopened the closed question of alsace and lorraine is it not germany herself great britain russia the united states and italy who would not have supported france in an offensive war with the objective of getting back her lost provinces are now a most determined unit in favour of the restoration of alsace and lorraine to france as a result of the defensive war germany forced her to wage that would be justice pure and simple the peace treaty must do it germany having run the risk of reopening the alsace lorraine acute question the allies must close it anew but this time against the huns germany must also pay for the devastation she has savagely spread in france i stand firm for a final settlement of the austro-italian too long pending question by giving to italy the trentino territory to which she has an evident national claim supported by the best of geographical conditions servia's independence must be once more secured and poland should be resuscitated the united states part in the war is truly a grand a noble one they have no particular territorial interest to serve their only object is the general public good they will be the benefactors of humanity in claiming for their allies the above enunciated conditions without which no just and durable peace can be expected nor obtained it is most important to caution the public against the insidious clamours of our pacifists trying again to deceive the people by asserting that germany is ready to negotiate for peace on fair terms the huns will acquiesce only to such peace terms as they will be forced to the allies are better to be guided in consequence in their unfaltering determination to realize a just and durable peace by a glorious victory End of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine of england canada and the great war this librivox recording is in the public domain england canada and the great war by louis georges desjardins chapter thirty nine conclusion my ardent desire to speak the plain truth and only the truth is just as strong to-day as it was when in concluding my french work i summarized the situation such as it was at the end of the year nineteen sixteen to show the hard duty incumbent on all the allies canada included it has been perhaps still more intensified 
by the outrageous efforts of those amongst us whose sole object has been since the outbreak of the hostilities to discourage our people from the herculean task they had bravely undertaken two years have since elapsed years full of great events and of untiring heroism on the part of the glorious defenders of justice and right and i do not see the slightest reason to modify the conclusions i then arrived at as a matter of strict duty unworthy of public confidence is the man who pandering to the supposed prejudices of his countrymen refrains out of weakness or of more guilty considerations to tell them what they are bound to do for their own country for their empire for the world in the supreme crisis of our time true every one is longing for the restoration of peace but few are those who even before being tired of the war were ready to curb their heads under the german yoke are now praying for a compromise between the allies and their enemies there are some left it is sad to admit everywhere they are chased by the indignant public opinion daily growing more determined that millions of heroes shall not have given their lives in vain that millions of others wounded on the fields of battles shall not until the last of them is gone for ever be the betrayed victims of teutonic dastardly ambition true peace is sorely wanted and would be welcomed by the thanksgivings to the almighty of grateful peoples who have borne with undaunted courage such untold and admirable sacrifices to uphold their rights and their honour but it cannot be sued for by the nations whom germany wanted to enslave by the might of her crushing militarism operating under the dictates of a new code of international law of her own barbarous creation thank god the flowing tide of unlimited teutonic ambition let loose over the world more than four years ago has met with inaccessible summits where love of justice respect of right devotion to human civilization obedience to christian law heroism of sacrifices were so deeply entrenched that they could not be reached and conquered from this commanding altitude they not only continue to defy the tyrants bent on dominating the universe but they are mightily smashing their power from the overshadowing point of view which cannot be forgotten or willfully abandoned nothing has changed since the german empire in her delirious aspirations challenged the world to the almost superhuman conflict by which she felt certain to succeed in realizing her fond dream of universal domination at the outbreak of the war ever since to-day to-morrow there were there are and there will be but three alternatives to the restoration of peace one a victorious german peace imposed on beaten and cowed belligerents the peace of the defeatists two a peace by compromise patched up by disheartened pacifists lured by cunningness winning where force would have failed to succeed to agree to conditions pregnant with all the horrors of a new and still greater struggle in the near future three a peace the result of the indomitable courage and perseverance of all the nations who have joined together to put an end to germany's ambition to rule the world and to destroy the instrument created for that iniquitous purpose prussian militarism there could be a fourth alternative to peace but it would be possible only by a miracle which we can grant without hesitation the world has perhaps not yet deserved it would be peace restored by the sudden conversion of germany to the practice of sound christian principles acknowledging how guilty she has been repenting for her crimes agreeing to atone for them as much as possible and taking the unconditional pledge to henceforth behave like a civilized nation all must admit that there is not the slightest hope of such a move from a nation whose autocratic kaiser answering in february last an address presented to him by the burgomaster of hamburg thundered out in his usual blasting manner that the neighboring peoples to enjoy the sweetness of germany's friendship quote, must first recognize the victory of german arms end quote. as an inducement to the allies to bow to his wishes he pointed to germany's achievement in russia where a beaten enemy quote, perceiving no reason for fighting longer end quote, clasped hands with the generous huns the world has since learned with appalling horror with what tender mercy the barbarous teutons reciprocated the grasping of hands of defeated russia tendered to them by the bolsheviki's traitors the allies had then to select one of the three above-mentioned alternatives they have made their choice and they will stick close to it until it is achieved by the victory of their arms knowing as they do that the future of their peoples and that of the whole world are at stake they will not waver in their heroic determination to free humanity from germany's cruel yoke viewed from the commanding height it requires to be worthily appreciated the joint military effort of the allies offers a truly grand spectacle daily enlarging and getting more gloriously magnificent 
all the allies every one of them are doing their duty and their respective share in the great crisis they are pledged to bring to a triumphant conclusion belgium and servia were the first to be martyred but the hour of their resurrection is getting nearer every day france the british empire the united states italy have done and are doing wonders there can there must be no question of appraising their respective merit with the intention of giving more credit either to the one or to the other with the greatest possible sincerity i affirm my humble but positive opinion that each one of the allies has done and is doing with overflowing measure all that courage could and can earnestly perform all that patriotism and the noblest national virtues can inspire france has been heroic to the highest limit the British Empire, Great Britain and her colonies, has been grand in her unswerving determination to fight to a finish. The great American Republic is putting forth a wonderful exhibition of pluck, of strength, of boldness, of inexhaustible resources. Italy has stood nobly with her new friends ever since she broke away from the Triple Alliance to escape the dishonour of remaining on good terms with the central empires in the shameful depth of their ignominious course she has bravely gone through days of disaster which she has heroically redeemed. All the Allies, bound together by the most admirable unity of purpose, only rivalling in the might of their respective patriotic effort, have nobly, quote, chosen their course upon principle, end quote, can never turn back. They must move steadily forward until victorious. They are indomitable in their decision not to live under any circumstances, quote, in a world governed by intrigue and force, end quote echoing the wise and inspiring words addressed by president wilson to congress on the eleventh of february last we can affirm that the quote, desire of enlightened men everywhere is for a new international order under which reason justice and the common interests of mankind shall prevail without that new order the world will be without peace and human life will lack tolerable conditions of existence and development end quote. a most encouraging achievement was realized a few months ago emphasizing to the utmost the unity of purpose of the allies every one of them have millions of men under arms and at the front it is easily conceived how tremendous is the task of properly directing the military operations of such immense armies unprecedented in the whole human history most patriotically putting aside all national susceptibilities the statesmen governing the allied nations acknowledge the necessity of supporting unity of purpose by unity of military command their decision was heartily approved and applauded by all and everywhere. It is important to note the great difference between the standing of the two groups of belligerents with regard to the leadership of the armies. Whilst the powers dominated by Germany, and fighting with her, are coerced to endure the Teutonic military supremacy of command, those warring on the side of France have almost cordially agreed to the appointment of a commander-in-chief out of the profound conviction that unity of command was more and more becoming a necessity for the successful prosecution of the war since this most urgent decision has been taken events have surely proved its wisdom and usefulness evidently the same as unity of purpose to bear all its fruits must be wrought out by statesmanship of a high order unity of military command to produce its natural advantages must be exercised with superiority of leadership great statesmen in a free country are successful in the management of state affairs just as much as they inspire an increasing confidence in their political genius developed by a wide experience honesty of purpose a constant patriotic devotion to the public weal great military leaders can do wonders when their achievements are such as to create unbounded reliance on their ability superiority of command proved by victories won in very difficult circumstances is always sure to be rewarded by an enlightened enthusiasm permeating the whole rank and file of an army and trebling the strength and heroism of every combatant added to the widespread renewal of confidence produced by the timely decision of the allies to rely on unity of military command is the reassuring evidence that the commander-in-chief to whom has been imposed the grand task of leading the unified armies to a final and glorious triumph is trusted by all soldiers and others alike the cause for which the allied nations are fighting with so much tenacity and courage being that of salvation of civilization threatened by a wave of barbarism equal at least to if not surpassing any to which humanity has so far survived all must admire the wonderful spectacle offered by those millions and millions of men under arms from so many different countries united under one command into a military organization which can most properly be called the grand army of human freedom 
it has been said by one who has presided over the destinies of the american republic as the chief of state that peace must be dictated from berlin can we really hope to behold the dawn of such a glorious day it is hardly to be supposed that germany would wait this last extremity to realize that she must abandon for ever her dream of universal domination relieve the world from the enervating menace of her military terrorism and redeem her past diabolical course by the repentant determination to join with her former enemies to deserve for mankind long years of perpetual peace with all the providential blessings of order freedom truly intellectual moral and material progress when the kaiser ordered his hordes to violate belgium's territory to overrun france in order to crush her out of existence as a military and political power preparatory to their triumphant march to st petersburg in his wild ambition which he made blasphemous by pretending that it was divinely inspired he felt sure that his really wonderful army which he believed was and would remain matchless would in a few weeks enter paris what a reverse of fortune what a downfall from extravagant expectations would be a return of the tide which after flowing to the very gates of paris spreading devastation and crimes all over the fair lands it submerged would ebb broken and powerless to berlin bringing the haughty tyrant to his knees before his victors. If such a day of deliverance is providentially granted the world, having deserved it by an indomitable courage in resisting oppression, history would again repeat itself, but with a different result. The French tricolore would once more enter proud Berlin, but this time it would not be alone to be hoisted over the conquered capital of the modern Huns, scarcely less savage than their forefathers it would be entwined with the union jack of great britain and ireland the stars and stripes of the united states the colours of italy and i add with an inexpressible feeling of loyal and national pride with the dominion colours so brilliantly glorified by the heroism of our canadian soldiers who have proved themselves the equals of the bravest through the protracted but ever glorious campaign unfolded with those of australia and south africa into the glorious flag of the british empire when after the glorious battle of vienna the great napoleon who could have ruined for ever the rising prussian monarchy entered berlin at the head of his victorious legions the new caesar then already the victim of his unlimited ambition represented though issued from a powerful popular movement triumphant absolutism in our days on entering berlin as the final act of this wonderful drama the entwined colours of the allies would symbolize human freedom delivering germany herself and the whole world from autocratic rule such a memorable event taking place and rank with the most remarkable in the world's history the great satisfaction of all those who would have contributed to its achievement would be that the joint colours of the allies would not be raised over germany's capital to crush the defeated nation under despotic caesarism but to deliver her from autocratic tyrannical rule waving with dignity over the great empire they would have freed from the thraldom of absolutist militarism they could be welcomed as the promise of the renewal, for her as well as for her victorious rivals, of the reign of justice, of Christian precepts, of right, order and peace, of honest and productive labour, of science applied to works creative of human happiness, instead of diverting the marvellous resources of the great modern discoveries to criminal uses for the calamitous misfortune of the peoples. I will close this work with the expression of two of the wishes I have most at heart, cherishing the confident hope that they will be realised england france and the united states fighting as they do for the triumph of such a sacred cause should emerge indissolubly united from the great struggle they have pledged themselves to carry to a successful issue i cannot conceive that so many millions of their heroic defenders will have given their lives only for a temporary achievement soon to be forgotten they will be gone for ever their sacrifices will be eternal they must bear permanent fruits united in death buried together in the soil of france flooded with their blood from their glorious graves they will implore their surviving countrymen to remain shoulder to shoulder in peace as they are in war their holocaust should be the holy seed from which loyal amity ought to grow ever stronger between the future generations of their countrymen who could not testify in a more eloquent and noble way their everlasting gratitude for the glorious heritage of permanent freedom they will have derived from their heroism a most enthusiastic daily witness of the immortal deeds of the millions of our brothers sons and friends fighting with such splendid courage in the land of my forefathers for our common cause how often have i for the last four years ardently vowed to god from the very bottom of my heart deeply moved by the reports of their noble achievements 
that those who will rest for ever in the ground over which they fell heroically may enjoy from above the inspiring spectacle of the union for the permanent triumph of liberty and christian civilization of the great nations for whose grand future they gave their lives i also most earnestly hope that the more fortunate of our defenders who will return either safe from the fields of battle or proudly wearing the glorious wounds which will have crippled their bodies but not their hearts will enjoy from the sanctuary of their homes made comfortable by their grateful compatriots the profound satisfaction to see the holy union cemented on the thundering firing line perpetuated for the lasting prosperity and happiness of mankind the last shadow of the recollections of the feuds of past ages between england and france should be forever sunk in patriotic oblivion buried deep beneath the glory both valorous nations will have jointly reaped in their mighty efforts to rescue the world from the frightful wave of barbarism which they will have forced to recede all the well-wishers of peaceful and happy days for future generations are very much gratified at knowing that in joining with the allies in the mighty struggle they were carrying with such undaunted courage the great american republic was also inspired by a feeling of gratitude for france in remembrance of what she has done to help her to achieve her independence let us behold anew the inscrutable designs of providence nearly a century and a half has elapsed since france england and her american colonies seem to be for all times irreconcilable opponents what a change in destiny years have rolled by new and unforeseen conditions have been developed the world over gradually two great currents of thoughts and aspirations have been flowing with increased strength preparing a formidable clash which was to threaten civilization with utter destruction autocratic ambition was for many long years challenging political liberty to a deadly conflict at last from the cloudy sky came the flash of lightning and the thunderbolt was on the earth shaking it to its depths by the tremendous shock germany having fired the wonderful autocratic shot fully expected that her rivals would be thunderstruck beyond possibility of resurrection but to her great dismay the friends of political liberty the world over rallied as one man to its defence and germany trembled at seeing england varying forever all ill feelings against france her ancient foe rushing to her support with millions of her brave sons after having drawn around her ally the protecting chain of her matchless fleet another very discomforting surprise was in store for the cruel huns the american republic grateful to france for past services was also moved by renovated feelings of affection for the mother country from whom she had parted without disowning her determined to be at the forefront of the battle for the triumph of human freedom after unsuccessfully exhausting every means of bringing germany to her senses she clasped hands with england and france and valiantly rallied to their sides to share the merit and the glory of saving political liberty from the terrible teutonic onslaught in my humble but sincere and profound opinion the present spectacle offered to the world's admiration by the sacred and mighty union of the british empire france and the united states every patriotic home of theirs thrilling with undiminished enthusiasm for the success of their heroic efforts is a truly grand one inspiring unbounded faith in the future of humanity let no one forget for a moment that the present war certainly national so far as the existence of each one of the allied states is concerned is above all preeminently a world's conflict which favourable issue deeply concerns the destiny of all the peoples of the earthly globe the whole question is whether autocratic tyranny will henceforth rule the world or if humanity will yet enjoy the blessings of liberty of free institutions in all hearts must abide the supreme desire that when peace is restored with all and the only conditions to which they can agree the british empire france and the american republic will for ever remain united to promote the prosperity and the welfare of all the nations of the earth large middle-sized or small the duty of those of imperialist proportions will be as hitherto performed by england and the united states in their democratic way to protect the independence of the small states never aspiring to any territorial acquisitions but those accruing to them with the full and free consent of the new populations asking the protection of their aegis and the advantages of their union when i consider the grand and magnificent part the three above-named leading nations can play for the happy future of humanity by working hand in hand and shoulder to shoulder for general peace order and prosperity my heart is full with the ardent desire to witness them accepting that glorious task with the stern determination to accomplish it to its better end in spite of the vicissitudes and the failings of their past they have done a great deal for the general good they can do still more in the future 
like every man bearing with fortitude the trials of life with the worthy design of profiting by the experience thus acquired to elevate himself to a higher conception of his duty the british empire france and the united states will undoubtedly emerge from behind the dark clouds of the present days with aspirations ennobled by the sacrifices they are making purified by the sufferings and the holocaust of so many of their own with a stronger will to help working out the world's destiny by maintaining permanent peace and good will amongst men if they pursue that dignified course of high ideals they will fully deserve the admiration and the gratitude of all those who will benefit by their examples and reap the abundant fruits of their devoted and enlightened leadership it is one of the blessings of true political liberty when duly understood and intelligently practised to produce a class of politicians and statesmen of wide experience of commanding character of high culture of great attainments with a superior training in the management of public affairs who are readily acknowledged as national leaders by the people who confidently trust them reserving of course their constitutional right to call new men to office whenever they consider in the public interest to do so those trusted leaders do not claim as the german autocratic kaiser the power by divine right to do anything they please asserting that in every imaginable case they do the will of the almighty when charged with the government of their country they understand very well that their duty is to manage the national affairs under their responsibility first to the divine ruler as any other man in any other calling secondly to those who having required their services have the constitutional right to call them to account for their stewardship just as confidence is the basis of sound national credit trust on the part of the people and responsibility on that of the national leaders are the two cornerstones of free institutions great britain and her great autonomous colonies also for many long years past have been most fortunate in the choice of the national leaders whom they have successively entrusted with the affairs of state in that momentous occurrence more than four years ago when the whole question whether great britain would go to war or not was laid before the imperial parliament supported by the strongest possible reasons in favour of the decision to accept the challenge of germany and fight with the firm determination not to sheathe the sword before victory was won no british public man would have dared like the german emperor to claim by divine authority the right to violate the solemn treaties the provisions of which his country was in honour and duty bound to carry out to the very letter the commanding parts national leaders play in a free country in consequence of the public confidence they inspire and enjoy can have their counterparts in the great society of nations whatever shall be the final settlement of all the difficult matters brought up for solution by the war it is certain that the management of the world's affairs will be well served by the legitimate influence of great nations whose leadership will be beneficial just in proportion as it is itself directed by the true principles of political freedom and an uncompromising respect of the rights of weaker nations always entitled to the fairest dealings on the part of their stronger associates in the great commonwealth of sovereign states there cannot be the slightest doubt that the british empire france and the united states until providentially ordered otherwise will hereafter be the three leading nations of the world their union maintained sacred in peace as it is in war will be the safest guarantee that the days of autocratic domination have ended henceforth the tide of political freedom will flow with increased rapidity and strength the only danger ahead against which it is always wise to provide with due care and foresight is that which would be the result of abuse and wild expectations always sure to react in favour of absolutist principles political liberty and order governmental authority and freedom both well directed must work hand in hand for the national welfare the british empire france and the american republic are free countries more and better than any others they should and must by example and friendly advice lead the peoples in the successful practice of self-government considering more especially the part the british empire will be called upon to play in the reorganized world freed from autocratic terrorism we must not lose sight of the much larger place england's great autonomous colonies will occupy in the broadened english commonwealth we canadians together with our brethren from australia new zealand and south africa will have done our glorious share to win the war we shall have to perform with equal devotion the new duty of sharing the british empire's task in gradually elevating the nations to an enlightened practice of political liberty evidently to do so with the success this noble cause will deserve we must first strive to utilize our admirable free institutions to the best advantage 
for ourselves, for our own future, and for the grand destinies of our empire. As an instrument of good government, our constitutional charter is almost perfect, as much so as anything worldly can be. Let us never forget that the best weapon for self-protection may become useless, or even dangerous for us, if not handled with the required intelligence, justice, and skill. We would lose all claims to contribute guiding others in the enjoyment of free institutions, if we ourselves were mistaken in the proper working of our own constitution, from a misconception of its literal wording, or of its largeness of spirit. We must never challenge the truth that, quote, spirit giveth life, end quote. More than ever, the supreme difficulties of governing numerous racial groups, issued from ancient stocks so long divided by endless feuds, the result of the many sudden changes of territorial limits to be wrought by the restoration of peace, will be very hard to settle satisfactorily. The task will require the constant effort of statesmanship of a high order. Many of those who will hereafter be trained to self-government will look to us for their guidance. We must give them the inspiring example of fair play, of justice for all, of unity of purpose, and aspirations in the diversity of ethnical offsprings. Need I say that the most urgent duty of all fair-minded Canadians is, and will ever be, to heartily join together, to bless our dear country with concord, good feeling, harmony, and kindly dispositions to grant an overflowing measure of justice to all our countrymen of all origins and creeds. Writing this book, with the express purpose of explaining and strongly disapproving the deplorable efforts of a few to deter my French-Canadian compatriots from doing their bounden duty through the dire crisis we are all undergoing, I will close these pages by calling anew upon my English-speaking countrymen not to judge them by the sayings and deeds of persons who can at times somewhat stir up dangerous prejudices, but who are utterly incompetent to lead them as they should and deserve to be. Silenced at last by a patriotic measure to censure any disloyal expression of sentiments, matters have easily resumed their regular and honourable course. All loyal citizens, throughout the length and breadth of the land, have, I am sure, much rejoiced at the loyalty with which the French Canadians, of all classes, religious, social, commercial, industrial, financial, agricultural, have united to obey a statute of military service to which many of them did not agree, as long as they had the constitutional right to differ from the opinion of the large majority of our people, but to the successful operation of which they rallied the moment it was the law of the land. The worthy leaders of our Church strongly recommended obedience to the decision of the constituted authority, firmly condemned any guilty attempt at disturbing public order, and ordered all the members of their flocks to fervously pray the Almighty for peace with victory for the Allies our, quote, pacifists at all hazards, end quote, once more silenced, this time by the very religious leaders under whose aegis they had shamefully tried to shield themselves, the patriotic impulse was moved to most commendable action. Without waiting for the call of the law, hundreds of young men from the better classes, from the universities and other educational institutions, well educated, voluntarily enlisted and rallied to the colours at least as much as in the other provinces, the class of our young manhood called by law heartily responded, all the real leaders of public opinion uniting to give the only advice loyal men could express. For one, I was most happy to ascertain how favourably Western public feeling was impressed by the new turn of thoughts and events in the province of Quebec. The reaction of sentiments operating both ways, in Ontario, the Western provinces and Quebec, augurs well for the final abatement of the excitement for which a time menaced our fair dominion with regrettable racial strifes so much to be deprecated. It can be positively affirmed that the whole people of Canada, east to west, north to south, are now more than ever a unit in their patriotic determination to fight the war to its final victorious issue. To this end, the two millions of French-British subjects in Canada, in perfect communion of thoughts and aspirations with the two millions of the neighbouring republic subjects of French-Canadian origin, are loyally doing, and will continue to do, their share. Their representatives at the front are gloriously fighting the common enemy. Their valour and their achievements during the Allies' offensive, so masterly planned and carried out by the commander-in-chief, Fach, have been worthy of their victories at Ypres, Vimy, Courcelette, Pachandel. Many have, during the last three months, given their lives for the cause they defend. Many more have been wounded and are anxiously waiting their cure, when possible, to return to the field of honour. Daily reports from the front tell of their enthusiasm, of their bravery, of their heroism. The French Canadians, I have no hesitation whatever in vouching for it, 
will continue to bear stoically with the sacrifices of so many kinds the conflict imposes upon them though smarting as all others under the burden yet they cheerfully pay the heavy taxes required from the country to meet our national obligations the outcome of the war so all is for the best under the strenuous present conditions of our national existence in closing i pray leave to reiterate from the introduction to this work the following lines expressing my most sincere and profound conviction i hope and most ardently wish that all my readers will agree with me that next to the necessity of winning the war and may i say even as of almost equal importance for the future grandeur of our beloved country range that of promoting by all lawful means harmony and good will amongst all our countrymen whatever may be their racial origin their religious faith their particular aspirations not conflicting with their devotion to canada as a whole nor with their loyalty to the british empire whose grandeur and prestige they want to firmly help to uphold with the inspiring confidence that more and more they will be the unconquerable bulwark of freedom, justice, civilization, and right. May I be allowed to conclude by saying that my most earnest desire is to do all in my power, in the rank and file of the great army of free men, to reach the goal which ought to be the most persevering and patriotic ambition of loyal Canadians of all origins and creeds. And I repeat, wishing my words to be re-echoed throughout the length and breadth of the land I so heartily cherish, I have always been, I am, and will ever be, to my last breath, true to my oath of allegiance to my sovereign and to my country. End of chapter 39《Appendices to England, Canada, and the Great War》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. England, Canada, and the Great War by Louis Georges Desjardins. Appendix A. President Wilson's Speech. To the United States Congress, eleventh day of February, nineteen eighteen. On the above mentioned date, Mr. Wilson, the President of the Great American Republic, delivered the following speech to the Congress in Washington. This noble and statesmanlike utterance met with the unanimous and enthusiastic approval of the members of both houses and was highly applauded, not only in the United States, but over all the truly civilized world. It reads thus, quote, On the 8th of January I had the honor of addressing you on the objects of the war as our people conceive them. The Prime Minister of Great Britain had spoken in similar terms on the 5th of January. To these addresses the German Chancellor replied on the 24th, and Count Cernan for Austria on the same day. It is gratifying to have our desire so promptly realized that all exchanges of view on this great matter should be made in the hearing of all the world. Count Cernan's reply, which is directed chiefly to my own address on the 8th of January, is uttered in a very friendly tone. He finds in my statement a sufficiently encouraging approach to the views of his own government to justify him in believing that it furnishes a basis for a more detailed discussion of purposes by the two governments he has represented to have intimated that the views he was expressing had been communicated to me beforehand, and that I was aware of them at the time he was uttering them. But in this I am sure he was misunderstood. I had received no intimation of what he intended to say. There was, of course, no reason why he should communicate privately with me. I am quite content to be one of his public audiences. Count von Hertling's reply is, I may say, very vague and very confusing, it is full of equivocal phrases and leads it is not clear where. But it is certainly in a very different tone from that of Count Cernan, and apparently of an opposite purpose. It confirms, I am sorry to say, rather than removes, the unfortunate impression made by what we had learned of the conferences at Brest-Litovsk. His discussion and acceptance of our general principles leads him to no practical conclusions. He refuses to apply them to the substantiate items which must constitute the body of any final settlement. He is jealous of international action and of international counsel. He accepts, he says, the principle of public diplomacy, but he appears to insist that it be confined, at any rate in this case, to generalities and that the several particular questions of territory and sovereignty, the several questions upon whose settlement must depend the acceptance of peace by the twenty-three states now engaged in the war, must be discussed and settled not in general council, but severally by the nations most immediately concerned by interest of neighbourhood. He agrees that the seas should be free, but looks askance at any limitation to that freedom by international action in the interest of the common order. 
he would without reserve be glad to see economic barriers removed between nation and nation for that could in no way impede the ambitions of the military party with whom he seems constrained to keep on terms neither does he raise objection to a limitation of armaments that matter will be settled of itself he thinks by the economic conditions which must follow the war but the german colonies he demands must be returned without debate he will discuss with no one but the representatives of russia what disposition shall be made of the peoples and the lands of the baltic provinces with no one but the government of france the quote unquote, conditions under which french territory shall be evacuated and only with austria what shall be done with poland in the determination of all questions affecting the balkan state he defers as i understand him to austria and turkey and with regard to the agreements to be entered into concerning the non-Turkish peoples of the present Ottoman Empire, to the Turkish authorities themselves. After a settlement all around effected in this fashion, by individual barter and concession, he would have no objection, if I correctly interpret his statement, to a league of nations which would undertake to hold the balance of power steady against external disturbance. It must be evident to every one who understands what this war has wrought in the opinion and temper of the world, that no general peace, no peace worth the infinite sacrifices of these years of tragical suffering, can possibly be arrived at in any such fashion. The method the German Chancellor proposes is the method of the Congress of Vienna. We cannot and will not return to that. What is at stake now is the peace of the world. What we are striving for is a new international order, based upon broad and universal principles of right and justice, no mere peace of shreds and patches, is it possible that count von hertling does not see that does not grasp it is in fact living in his thought in a world dead and gone has he utterly forgotten the reichstag's resolutions of the nineteenth of july or does he deliberately ignore them they spoke of the conditions of a general peace not of national aggrandizement or of arrangements between state and state the peace of the world depends upon just settlement of each of the several problems to which i adverted in my recent address to congress I, of course, do not mean that the peace of the world depends upon the acceptance of any particular set of suggestions as to the way in which those problems are to be dealt with. I mean only that those problems, each and all, affect the whole world, that unless they are dealt with in a spirit of unselfish and unbiased justice, with a view to the wishes, the natural connections, the racial aspirations, the security and peace of mind of the peoples involved, no permanent peace will have been attained they cannot be discussed separately or in corners. None of them constitutes a private or separate interest from which the opinion of the world may be shut out. Whatever affects the peace affects mankind, and nothing settled by military force, if settled wrong, is settled at all. It will presently have to be reopened. Is Count von Hertling not aware that he is speaking in the court of mankind, that all the awakened nations of the world now sit in judgment on what every public man of whatever nation may say on the issues of a conflict which has spread to every region of the world the reichstag's resolutions of july nineteen themselves frankly accepted the decisions of that court there shall be no annexations no contributions no punitive damages peoples are not to be handed about from one sovereignty to another by an international conference or an understanding between rivals and antagonists. National aspirations must be respected. Peoples may now be dominated and governed only by their own consent. Quote-unquote self-determination is not a mere phrase. It is an imperative principle of action, which statesmen will henceforth ignore at their peril. We cannot have general peace for the asking, or by the mere arrangements of a peace conference, it cannot be pieced together out of individual understandings between powerful states. All the parties to this war must join in the settlement of every issue anywhere involved in it, because what we are seeking is a peace that we can all unite to guarantee and maintain, whether it be right and fair, an act of justice, rather than a bargain between sovereigns. The United States has no desire to interfere in European affairs or to act as arbiter in European territorial disputes we would disdain to take advantage of any internal weakness or disorder to impose her own will upon other people. She is quite ready to be shown that the settlements she has suggested are not the best or the most enduring. They are only her own provisional sketch of principles, and of the way in which they should be applied. But she entered this war because she was made a partner, whether she would or not, in the sufferings and indignities inflicted by the military masters of Germany, 
against the peace and security of mankind and the conditions of peace will touch her as nearly as they will touch any other nation to which is entrusted a leading part in the maintenance of civilization she cannot see her way to peace until the causes of this war are removed its renewal rendered as nearly as may be impossible this war had its roots in the disregard of the rights of small nations and of nationalities which lack the union and the force to make good their claim to determine their own allegiances and their own forms of political life covenants must now be entered into which will render such things impossible for the future and those covenants must be backed by the united force of all the nations that love justice and are willing to maintain it at any cost if territorial settlements and the political relations of great populations which have not the organized power to resist are to be determined by the contracts of the powerful governments which consider themselves most directly affected as count von hertling proposes why may not economic questions also it has come about in the altered world in which we now find ourselves that justice and the rights of people affect the whole field of international dealing as much as access to raw materials and fair and equal conditions of trade count von hertling wants the essential basis of commercial and industrial life to be safeguarded by common agreement and guarantee but he cannot expect that to be conceded him if the other matters to be determined by the articles of peace are not handled in the same way as it was in the final accounting he cannot ask the benefit of common agreement in the one field without according it in the other i take it for granted that he sees that separate and selfish compacts with regard to trade and the essential materials of manufacture would afford no foundation for peace neither he may rest assured will separate and selfish compacts with regard to the provinces and peoples count cernan seems to see the fundamental elements of peace with clear eyes and does not seek to obscure them he sees that an independent poland made up of all the indisputably polish peoples who lie contiguous to one another is a matter of european concern and must of course be conceded that belgium must be evacuated and restored no matter what sacrifices and concessions that may involve and that national aspirations must be satisfied even within his own empire in the common interest of europe and mankind if he is silent about questions which touch the interest and purpose of his allies more nearly than they touch those of austria only it must of course be because he feels constrained i suppose to defer to germany and turkey in the circumstances seeing and conceding as he does the essential principles involved and the necessity of candidly applying them he naturally feels that austria can respond to the purpose of peace as expressed by the united states with less embarrassment than could germany he would probably have gone much farther had it not been for the embarrassments of austria's alliance and of her dependence upon germany after all the test of whether it is possible for either government to go any further in this comparison of views is simple and obvious the principles to be applied are first that each part of the final settlement must be based on the essential justice of the particular case and upon such adjustments as are most likely to bring a peace that will be permanent second that peoples and provinces are not to be bartered about from sovereignty to sovereignty as if they were mere chattels and pawns in a game even the great game now for ever discredited of the balance of power but that every territorial settlement involved in this war must be made in the interest and for the benefit of the populations concerned and not as a part of any mere adjustment of compromise of claims amongst rival states fourth that all well-defined national aspirations shall be accorded the utmost satisfaction that can be accorded them without introducing new or perpetuating old elements of discord and antagonism that would be likely in time to break the peace of europe and consequently of the world a general peace entered upon such foundations can be discussed until such a peace can be secured we have no choice but to go on so far as we can judge these principles that we regard as fundamental are already everywhere accepted as imperative except among the spokesmen of the military and annexationist party in germany if they have anywhere else been rejected the objectors have not been sufficiently numerous or influential to make their voices audible the tragic circumstance is that this one party in germany is apparently willing and able to send millions of men to their death to prevent what all the world now sees to be just i would not be a true spokesman of the people of the united states if i did not say once more that we entered this war upon no small occasion and that we can never turn back from a course chosen upon principle our resources are in part mobilized now and we shall not pause until they are mobilized in their entirety 
our armies are rapidly going to the fighting front and will go more rapidly our whole strength will be put into this state of emancipation emancipation from the threat and attempted mastery of selfish groups of autocratic rulers whatever the difficulties and present partial delays we are indomitable in our power of independent action and can in no circumstances consent to live in a world governed by intrigue and force we believe that our own desire for a new international order under which reason and justice and the common interests of mankind shall prevail is the desire of enlightened men everywhere without that new order the world will be without peace and human life will lack tolerable conditions of existence and development having set our hand to the task of achieving it we shall not turn back i hope that it is not necessary for me to add that no word of what i have said is intended as a threat that is not the temper of our people i have spoken thus only that the whole world may know the true spirit of america that men everywhere may know that our passion for justice and for self-government is no mere passion of words but a passion which once set in act must be satisfied the power of the united states is a menace to no nation or people it will be never used in aggression or for the aggrandizement of any self-interest of our own it springs out of freedom and is for the service of freedom End quote. End of appendix a appendix b text of united states reply to austria on the eighteenth of september nineteen eighteen the secretary of state made public the official text of the letter he sent to mr w a f eckengren the swedish minister in charge of austro-hungarian affairs conveying president wilson's rejection of the austrian peace proposals it reads as follows quote, sir i have the honour to acknowledge the receipt of your note dated september sixteen communicating to me a note from the imperial government of austria-hungary containing a proposal to the government of all the belligerent states to send delegates to a confidential and unbinding discussion on the basic principles for the conclusion of peace furthermore it is proposed that the delegates would be charged to make known to one another the conception of their governments regarding these principles and to receive analogous communications as well as to request and give frank and candid explanations on all those points which need to be precisely defined in reply i beg to say that the substance of your communication has been submitted to the president who now directs me to inform you that the government of the united states feels that there is only one reply which it can make to the suggestion of the imperial austro-hungarian government it has repeatedly and with entire candour stated the terms upon which the united states would consider peace and can and will entertain no proposal for a conference upon the matter concerning which it has made its position and purpose so plain except sir the renewed assurances of my highest consideration signed robert lansing secretary of state end, quote. end of appendix b end of england canada and the great war by louis georges desjardins